This is Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. We're here to help you keep your finger on the pulse. Welcome back to Audible Bleeding. This is Kevin Canary. Some of you may know me from Behind the Knife, and this week I'm excited to introduce a collaboration that we are doing with Behind the Knife, a vascular trauma series podcast. We are going to do five individual episodes covering all aspects of vascular trauma, and we are lucky enough to have Dr. Todd Rasmussen as our guest, who is going to join us and be the expert for this series. Dr. Rasmussen is a colonel in the United States Air Force and is a professor of surgery and associate dean of research at the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences and an attending vascular surgeon at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. Dr. Rasmussen has deployed numerous times to Iraq and Afghanistan and cared for many traumatic vascular injuries at Walter Reed Medical Center. Through his experience in research, he has become one of the foremost leaders on the management of vascular trauma and recently published the third edition of Rich's Vascular Trauma. So thank you, Dr. Rasmussen, for joining us for this uh, collaborative series. Uh, you're welcome, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to join uh, the conversation. And just for our listeners out there, we're planning on doing five episodes. This first one is on uh, peripheral vascular uh, injuries and damage control. Then we're going to do uh, damage control surgery of the torso. Then we're going to talk about endovascular techniques of uh, vascular injuries and managing them. Uh, then we're going to have an episode solely devoted to Reboa. And we're going to I'll finish it off with uh, cervical carotid and vertebral artery injuries. So it's uh, going to be a pretty thorough series covering uh, many topics in vascular. So Dr. Rasby, we're just going to start off basic. We have a lot of med students that listen to our podcasts and, um, you know, it's a common question they get asked. But when you teach students, what do you tell them are the hard and soft signs of vascular injury? And, and more importantly, why are these important to know? You know, the classic hard signs of a vascular, peripheral vascular injury um, are um, obvious bleeding, either apparent bleeding in front of one's you know, eyes, uh, or even the history of bleeding by the, the team that, that, that brought, uh, brought the patient to you. Uh, so certainly um, evidence of significant hemorrhage is a hard sign of, 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 of vascular trauma that can be arterial or venous. Um, other hard signs of vascular injury are uh, a profound ischemia of the extremity, which, which, which can be determined by the uh, basic pulse uh, presence or absence of a pulse beyond uh, the area of injury, uh, and then um, the use of uh, continuous wave Doppler as well. And we can maybe talk, uh, elaborate a little bit on on the use of Doppler, uh, but but, the, but determining a profound ischemia would be another hard sign of vascular injury. Um, the presence of a expanding hematoma, and this sort of is aligned with uh, obvious bleeding, but but it may not be external bleeding. It may be an exter uh, uh, um, a hematoma that is expanding underneath a, a closed wound, a closed injury. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the presence of a audible uh, brewery or a palpable thrill. Um, not to be overlooked um, uh, is using a stethoscope uh, to, to listen over an area of injury and, and, and not uncommonly one can hear uh, an audible brewery, uh, which is indicative of a, it's a hard sign of a vascular injury, and in that case, a arterial venous fistula, um, uh, or a palpable thrill, which, which also can be felt as an indication of a high flow uh, arterial venous fistula. So those are really the hard signs uh, of vascular injury um, that, that I think are at the top of, of my list. Um, you know, the soft signs of vascular injury um, you know, by their name are a little more subtle and um, and they can be uh, things such as uh, uh, an injury pattern that is often associated with a vascular injury. For example, a posterior knee dislocation um, uh, in which uh, which is which is an injury pattern that uh, that is often associated with the subclinical vascular injury of the popliteal artery. Um, um, I think diminished uh, blood flow to the extremity, but not profound ischemia. So um, uh, maybe something such as a, you cannot, one cannot feel uh, the palpable pulse beyond the injury, but can hear a weak um, Doppler signal, arterial signal, uh, that is, uh, is, is, is sort of a subtle or softer sign of a, of a major vascular injury. 
Um, and then, you know, I think um, penetrating wounds in proximity uh, to to a, a major axial vessel uh, should cue one into the potential for a, a vascular injury if there's a penetrating wound near the femoral artery or the popliteal artery. Obviously, someone needs to uh, to, to be thinking about uh, is there an injury associated with that, um, and then peripheral nerve injuries. As 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 the audience knows, the uh, the neurovascular bundles um, uh, are such that if there is a peripheral nerve injury uh, from uh, uh, from a traumatic situation, not uncommonly the the same mechanism that either stretched or severed that uh, peripheral nerve. I did uh, the exact same thing to the vessel. So if there's a, a peripheral nerve injury, then that also should cue one in uh, to really be thinking about uh, uh, ruling out uh, a, a, a subclinical uh, vascular injury. Great, thank you for breaking those down in detail for us. And Jason, uh, not only are you a uh, behind the knife interviewer now, but you are uh, have multiple combat deployments under your own belt. Um, so, you know, I think I'm going to throw some of these questions at you also. So my first question, Jason, to you is, what are what are the initial principles of managing a bleeding extremity? Uh, yeah, sure, Kevin. Uh, so um, I, a lot of times these injuries are can be very distracting. Um, they can be pretty dramatic. Uh, but I think the key thing to remember is that these are often polytrauma patients, so uh, not to be uh, distracted to where you're missing other injuries. Certainly, the first thing to do is hold pressure and stop the bleeding, uh, whether that's uh, use of manual pressure, uh, placing a finger into a wound. Um, certainly, if it's on the extremity, um, uh, applying a tourniquet uh, and uh, tightening it down um, uh, until you're, you're getting, you know, no palpable pulse and the, and the bleeding stops. Sometimes that requires placing two tourniquets um, and then resuscitating the patient. So once you, um, I, I think an important thing, especially like, as you mentioned in the combat situation where these are like blast injuries and multiple types of injuries, once you have an effective tourniquet on a bleeding extremity, uh, you can temporarily kind of forget about it and uh, resuscitate the patient and identify other life threatening uh, injuries uh, before returning to it. So um, uh, so my initial thing is just stop the bleeding one way or another, whether that's a finger or a tourniquet, and then resuscitate the patient and, uh, and continue to work them up as you would any other trauma patient. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and Dr. Rasmussen, in your uh, The Riches uh, Vascular Trauma book, they describe the injury extremity index. Um, could you explain this concept uh, to our listeners? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you uh, for, for that question. It's, I, I was, I think in the last week, I, I expressed the phrase, if I had to take one tool with me uh, into, into a, into a uh, resuscitation room or an austere location uh, to evaluate for vascular injury, it would be the uh, continuous wave Doppler. And um, that Doppler is pretty, pretty handy. And uh, it's only more powerful if, if you can combine it with a manual blood pressure cuff and, uh, uh, and together the, uh, the continuous wave Doppler um, and, and the manual blood pressure cuff allow one to obtain an, an objective measure of perfusion uh, in a given extremity. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that uh, presence or absence of a palpable pulse can often be fairly subjective. Um, one provider may grade it a certain way. One provider may examine the same patient and not feel any pulse, and uh, it can be subjective. But but the presence or absence of an audible Doppler signal, an arterial signal, uh, for example, in the foot or in the wrist, um, uh, that's a start. So uh, using the Doppler, one can uh, say there is an audible Doppler signal or there is not, so presence or absence, and then the quality of the Doppler signal can also be assessed, um, whether it's strong and biphasic or weak and monophasic. Those are important qualitative descriptors of, a, of an arterial signal in the extremity beyond the injury site. And then using the manual blood pressure cuff, one can actually um, slowly inflate the, 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 the blood pressure cuff just proximal to the arterial signal, kind of like taking a blood pressure. I mean, it is. 
um, uh, and inflate that manual blood pressure cuff and, and measure the pressure at which the arterial signal uh, goes away. Um, and uh, that can then be uh, compared to a normal or non-injured extremity. And you know, the ratio, if there is no arterial injury, no flow limiting injury, the ratio should be one or slightly greater than one. Uh, uh, conversely, if, if the ratio is uh, for the injured extremity is, is uh, uh, less than uh, 0.9, uh, then that's indicative of a, of a flow limiting injury uh, in the artery to that extremity. So um, the, the injured extremity index, we also uh, refer to it as the ankle brachial index if it's in the, uh, if it's in the lower extremity. That's a powerful, um, powerful tool um, because it's objective. It can be repeated, um, you know, um, as, as we were just mentioning, if the patient happens to be in shock and is cold and clamped down, uh, vasoconstricted, if you will, uh, the injured extremity index can be repeated 10 or 15 minutes later as the patient is resuscitated and warmed. Um, so uh, I think having an arterial signal, uh, qualifying it's, it's uh, the nature of that arterial signal beyond the injury, and then um, adding uh, the objective measure of, of the, uh, the pressure at which it occludes, uh, I think is a tremendously uh, useful uh, uh, mechanism to evaluate for vascular injury. Uh, Colonel Rasmussen, so what, what do you think the uh, role of CTA is in the workup um, of extremity vascular trauma? That's another great question. And um, I think that, you know, we talked about, uh, I think we named the uh, hard and soft signs of vascular injury. Uh, you did a nice job of, uh, I think, outlining the, the immediate steps that need to be taken uh, uh, if, if, there's, uh, if there's hemorrhage, that, that hard sign. I guess the question is, what, what if there's a soft sign of vascular injury? What if, what if there is a reduced injury extremity index, such as, let's say, the ratio is 0.6 uh, or, or there's an audible brewery or palpable thrill um, or, or, or an injury pattern that's uh, associated with, uh, with, uh, with often with, a, with an arterial injury. It's in those situations uh, where I think a, an imaging study is, is really indicated. Uh, and more commonly now, that is, that is CTA. Uh, I think we spent decades uh, saying that, that traditional arteriography was the gold standard. Um, I recently wrote in a chapter that uh, I think I think we can we can say now that really CTA is 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 becoming or has become the gold standard uh, for the evaluation of extremity uh, vascular injury, partly because CTA has become uh, uh, I think uh, much higher quality now. And it's just so prevalent. Uh, um, patients get CTAs now for uh, it's it's very common and all, practically easy to get CTAs, uh, if you will. Um, and then it gives so much information about other parts of the the injured patient. So the uh, patient uh, can also get uh, imaging of the head or the torso or uh, other other extremities. So. I think CTA has become incredibly valuable. It's become more accurate, and I think we've become more used to interpreting it. So uh, I think uh, it is very important. Great, thank you. Um, so now we're gonna dive into uh, getting to the operating room. And so whether the patient has a hard sign or a soft sign with a, with a vascular injury, uh, can you talk us through some of the principles of, you know, getting this patient to the OR, setting them up, and just sort of the principles of peripheral vascular trauma? Well, I think, uh, you know, setting them up, I, I think, uh, as was already mentioned, it's very, it's, it's really uh, foremost uh, or, or mostly important to resuscitate the patient and to be mindful of his or her, uh, you know, physiology and, and hemodynamics. Uh, as we said, uh, an extremity vascular injury can be somewhat distracting. Uh, it can pull focus away from uh, really the, the most important uh, initial measures, which are making sure the patient is being resuscitated and warmed, uh, that the correct uh, ventilator settings are being uh, established, that the monitoring uh, is, is in place. So I think foremost, it's, it's, it's key uh, not to take – 
one's eye off of the, the patient and making sure that we are uh, uh, taking care that we don't pay too much attention to the uh, extremity vascular injury and lose sight of the core tenets of, of resuscitation and, uh, and just organ support, if you will, as we operate. Um, and that takes a lot of communication with the anesthesia team, uh, the circulating nurse, the technicians, the blood bank, uh, you really have to keep uh, eyes wide open as, uh, uh, and, and don't, don't uh, overlook any of, uh, aspect of resuscitating that patient or you will be all set to do the vascular injury in the leg and the patient uh, will, will, will die on the table because we've taken our eye off the ball. So um, having said that, um, you know, I think once the patient is set, you've got the team resuscitating him or her, then, um, you know, turning uh, your eye towards the extremity that's injured. I will say that, uh, you know, prep, prep that patient uh, uh, widely um, and uh, be mindful that, that, uh, that if it, uh, you know, the, the incision's likely to take more than what you think it will. Um, so if, uh, if the injury seems to be innocuous enough uh, at above the knee, uh, for example, above the knee popliteal artery, uh, I would still prep that patient uh, from their umbilicus down and prep both legs, for example, uh, because uh, you need to anticipate getting proximal control or, or doing an arteriogram at the femoral artery level. Uh, one needs to also anticipate the potential harvesting of saphenous vein for conduit. Uh, so, uh, you know, really have to, to, uh, to uh, I think, be prepared for a situation that is much worse than, than what you think you may encounter. Uh, uh, and then, you know, hope for the best, if you will. Prepare for the worst, hope for the best. Um, I would, I usually leave the tourniquet on, uh, off, you know, uh, I leave the tourniquet on and just prep it into the case uh, if, if you need to. Uh, I think taking that tourniquet down uh, if, uh, prematurely can, can be uh, uh, problematic for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it may result in, uh, in uh, you know, just uh, arterial bleeding. And uh, if one's not ready for that, the team is not ready for that, then that can be uh, catastrophic. Uh, and I guess similarly, uh, it can result in hypotension. And so I usually will prep those tourniquets, uh, you know, cut uh, as much of them away as you can, but leave their compressive effect on and just prep them into the field and then communicate uh, with anesthesia and, and say, hey, I'm going to let this uh, tourniquet down. Are you ready? Or do we have blood going in, everything under control? And then also obviously have a, a, a secondary measure to control bleeding as, as, as you let that tourniquet down. So um, um, I think those are sort of the key tenants. I mean, for the incisions, uh, you know, they just need to be uh, probably uh, twice as long as you think they do. Um, it, I mean, it depends upon the injury, of course, but, uh, but uh, I think, uh, you know, you can't sew what you can't see. Uh, and if you, if you don't expose the problem, you're not going to be able to see it. Um, and, and if you can't see it, you won't, can't control it, and you certainly can't sew uh, a repair. So um, I think those are sort of uh, tenants that, uh, that I would uh, mention uh, off, the, off the top anyway. Do you uh, routinely heparinize all these patients? Uh, I, that's a great question, and um, I hate to, to equivocate, but it depends, um, and it, it depends on whether or not they have other injuries. So if it's an isolated extremity injury and uh, the patient does not have any uh, torso bleeding, does not have a, any head trauma, then um, I, I will then, um, depending upon the degree of soft tissue injury, um, I will then uh, be more inclined to use uh, systemic heparin. Um, it, uh, if the patient has any other uh, injuries on in the torso of the head, or if it's just a, a large soft tissue injury, a traumatic amputation, for example, uh, on the other extremity, or then um, I will not give systemic heparin. And, uh, and then I'll just work uh, until I identify uh, the 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 arterial or the venous injury and use regional heparin, which is um, that is using heparinized saline flushed uh, up and down the injured vessel and, and really just heparinized locally or regionally. 
Uh, one question that I've heard come up a handful of times is, can you use saphenous vein from the, the injured extremity? Is that, uh, can that just be kind of provider's decision or is that a, a hard no-go and always use the contralateral? I think um, I've, I've evolved in this and I think um, it's from real world experience and uh, trying to be practical. Uh, I think our teaching, as you reference, is to use uh, saphenous vein from the other extremity um, or the contralateral extremity, but I am quite practical about it. I certainly have uh, used ipsilateral saphenous vein as a matter of uh, practicality. Sometimes it depends upon the injury. One may see it or encounter it there in the in the um, you know in the operative field. If it's a above knee femoral artery uh, injury, for example, a popliteal artery injury, you may encounter the saphenous vein there. If there's no deep vein injury. Uh, you know, the, the, the deep femoral vein is, is uh, in, in continuity and there's no venous injury and it's practical and it's part of the, uh, the incision and exposure, then, then I uh, will use ipsilateral saphenous vein, reversed uh, greater saphenous vein. If, if it's easy, if I have another person to harvest, a uh, team member who can prep out the other leg, then um, often I'll, I'll defer to that and, and use contralateral. Or if there's obviously a, a deep femoral um, venous injury associated with the arterial injury, I'll be more uh, deferential to using the uh, the contralateral saphenous vein in the reversed uh, uh, reverse configuration. So talk to me about um, so you have a you know vascular injury, you've debrided back to healthy tissue. How do you make the decision between are you going to primarily repair this? Or are you going to patch it? Or are you going to do an interposition graft? And then also, how do you make that distinction between using a prosthetic versus autologous uh, vein graft? It's a great question, and you know you can picture it now. And I think when you when an indiv when you as a surgeon have it as you described, you've, you've got it controlled. You've got uh, you know a debakey clamp on the proximal. You've got a debakey clamp on the distal, uh, and and you're feeling pretty good about it. Now you're setting up. You're really shifting gears into a different. Uh, a different uh, uh, phase of this this operation. Uh, it's important to just take a deep breath. I think at this point and uh, check with anesthesia. Um, make sure the patient's doing all right um, uh, from a global standpoint. Um, uh, and then I think uh, the other thing that at this point that I have uh, often overlooked. Uh, well, I, hopefully not often, but I have uh, overlooked is the importance of performing a proximal and distal thrombectomy and using the Fogarty catheter, uh, sort of as you're deciding, how am I, am I gonna fix this primarily? It's gonna take a interposition graft. Sometimes that takes a while. You have to kind of look at it and size that up. And, and while I'm sizing it up to buy time, uh, as I think about that, I'll, I'll sort of go through this checklist of uh, having a little conversation with anesthesia, making sure I passed a Fogarty uh, balloon catheter proximal to get thrombus out of the inflow, uh, making sure that uh, I've passed a Fogarty catheter distal to get uh, uh, thrombus out of the outflow, the distal part, um, and, 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 and then use at that point that regional heparin, uh, get heparinized saline and, and really put 40, 50, 60 cc's of heparinized saline down the outflow and really apply the clamp, do the same in the inflow. That buys you a little time as you're sort of thinking about and sizing up what's in front of you. Um, you know, I think uh, most arterial injuries in the lower extremities, I think, in my experience, need an interposition graft. Um, uh, certainly, if it's a grazing wound or a stab wound from a knife, uh, uh, there may be a role for primary repair or patch. But if one thinks there's going to be any compromise of the arterial, arterial lumen, uh, or tension on on the repair, then you're better off. Uh, I think, as you pointed out appropriately, you sort of debride the vessel back to make sure you're on healthy, uninjured vessel, and then and then performing a, an interposition graft. Most commonly, I mean, that's the uh, uh, most commonly venous injuries. Uh, you know, the veins are are more compliant and uh, they're larger. If you most of the time, and, and oftentimes you can get away with a lateral venorophy. Uh, you know. Uh, uh, primarily repairing the veins. And then sometimes in the upper extremities, the brachial artery has more redundancy. If you, if it's a very focal injury, uh, you can get a little 
stretch, if you will, and and and, and get those the brachial artery back together primarily. But uh, you know, I suspect, um, uh, geez, ninety percent or more of, uh, in my experience, uh, it, these are they require um, you know an interposition graft, and then the conduit. Um, you know, we. Uh, because most of the uh, wartime injuries uh, were contaminated and quite dirty, uh, we deferred to saphenous vein in more than 90 percent uh, uh, of cases, more than 95 percent of cases as the conduit. We felt like autologous vein was uh, was 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 the preference. I think if one's in a in a pinch um, and uh, you can't find vein, um, you don't have time to harvest vein. The wound is not too contaminated. Uh, if it's a proximal uh, uh, axillary or subclavian, uh, proximal femoral or iliac, uh, then I think using a prosthetic, uh, either Dacron or expanded PTFE uh, Gore-Tex is also acceptable. It's, it's uh, uh, acceptable. And there's some civilian literature that says that uh, PTFE is actually not just acceptable, but is, uh, you know, is, is uh, quite suitable and maybe even better than vein. Uh, that's not been our experience uh, in the deployed setting, but um, but I think you know keep all of those things in mind as you're as you're setting up to to this next phase of the of the operation. Well, now that we've covered the the principles of managing peripheral vascular injuries, we're going to dive in a little deeper on each level of kind of peripheral vascular injury. And first, we're going to talk about junctional hemorrhage, kind of our one of our biggest fears and, and most difficult to deal with. Um, so Dr. Rasmussen, can you take me through, you have a hematoma in the groin or pelvis, kind of at or above the inguinal ligament. Uh, what are the best ways to get control of this? Yeah, so the, uh, I think for the listeners, the junctional injuries, um, as you referred to, are those injuries that are in the junction areas between the torso and the extremities. So that'd be the distal external iliac and, and, and common femoral and uh, in, the, in the lower portion and, uh, and then the subclavian and axillary in the, in the upper extremities. Um, for, the, for the iliac artery um, or, the, or even just the proximal common femoral, um, I think uh, a retroperitoneal exposure uh, to, the, uh, to the, um, you know, the lower uh, quadrant of the abdomen, uh, we sometimes refer to that as a transplant incision, uh, is 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 quite suitable depending upon the injury pattern. I, I think, as I alluded to before, uh, try not to ever find yourself having underestimated uh, the 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 exposure you're going to need. So, uh, if if it truly is a groin hematoma, um, and you think uh, this this is uh, this could be common femoral or external iliac, uh, then in those cases, uh, either a transplant incision. To uh, you know, in a retroperitoneal fashion, uh, uh, to uh, to get that controlled, um, you know, that will allow one to get up to the common iliac uh, most often. Uh, and there's no um, harm in those cases uh, to just doing a laparotomy and, and finding it through the abdomen too. Um, it really depends upon the the injury um, and, and the scenario you find yourself in. Um, um, but that's that's sort of how I would uh, would approach a you know common femoral or distal iliac artery injury. Great. And um, and so what if you encountered a uh, internal iliac injury kind of deep in the pelvis that uh, you weren't able to control? Um, wh what are the consequences of, of ligating that? <laughs> Well, that is, uh, you know, that's real tiger country, of course, as, as you know, um, uh, sort of internal iliac uh, vessels. And I think um, in those cases, uh, it's really damage control. One of the things we haven't mentioned is the important tenant that, uh, as we talk about, one of the key tenants, maybe arguably one of the most important tenants uh, after hemorrhage control um, in damage control vascular is, is ligation. Um, oftentimes, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, setting up for a vascular repair, but, uh, but one of the reasons to check with anesthesia and to assess the whole of the patient is to recognize that in some scenarios, uh, the best thing is ligation and, uh, and, and then dealing with whatever consequences may result from that, but uh, keeping in mind sort of life over limb. Um, and not being too aggressive about trying to 
do some sort of exposure and repair of a, of a vessel that takes hours and, and many, many units of blood. So in that context, I think uh, if one finds bleeding from, from the internal, what we call the hypogastric vessels, I think uh, ligating those uh, uh, is, is quite acceptable. Um, there can be instances of pelvic ischemia, um, but if the other, if the contralateral iliac artery is, is open, uh, then uh, that's quite rare, I think, uh, to, to, to really create pelvic ischemia uh, ligating one of the, uh, the iliac arteries. Um, again, that really is, it depends upon what injury is in front of you and how the patient is doing as a whole. Um, and, and not uncommonly in those situations, one is dealing with artery and vein because they're right there together. And yeah, as I mentioned, that's, uh, that's real tiger country uh, if that's happening. Uh, in those situations, you know, the tenants of exposure, light, uh, two suctions, uh, don't use too small of a needle. You know, that's where the SH needle, uh, you know, uh, it, don't try to be too, uh, finesse those too much in the, in the pelvis because you won't be able to see your needle uh, and, and it's, it's a mess. So the SH needle, for example, uh, the, the blunt tip SH needle is uh, on a three or four proline is, is really nice in those situations uh, because the needle's big enough to actually see and work with uh, in a pool of blood. Now let's take that same in, let's take the same injury and move it now to the external iliacs. Um, so what are the you know, consequences of ligating the external iliacs and what are some of your options? Yeah, now in this situation, the external iliac, I think, because it's uh, the axial vessel to that extremity, I think uh, I would not ligate that with such impunity. Um, I think in those situations, um, controlling it and, uh, and making that assessment um, of whether or not to repair it uh, uh, is, is paramount. I think that you should do everything you can. I think that the consequences of ligating an external iliac artery uh, are going to be, you know, significant and, and include uh, quite proximal, uh, you know, extremity ischemia, including thigh and probably need for a, certainly an above knee amputation, if not uh, a disarticulation of the hip. So I think the external iliac needs to be preserved at all costs. One can either uh, try that uh, on their own or depending upon how the patient's doing or how your casualty flow your capabilities are also using a temporary vascular shunt uh, of some sort to uh, as a damage control maneuver is uh, is another option for the external iliac. Uh, what advice do you have for us on placing these shunts? Many times people place a shunt until it's time uh, to, that they need to, and uh, they can be quite tricky. Do you have any pieces of advice for our listeners? Well, I think the. Um, um, yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, you know, in the in the proximal vessels of the extremity, the, the temporary vascular shunts are quite useful. I think uh, it's important to know what shunts you have available in a given place. So uh, this is a, something to, to stroll through the operating room or your stock room, wherever you are, uh, when it's not busy and say, hey, what type of vascular shunts do we have here? Uh, there are four or five different types of shunts um, from anything from what's referred to as the Javid shunt to the Sunt shunt, S-U-N-D-T. Uh, there's the Argyle shunt. Um, and, and then, you know, there can be makeshift shunts, uh, such as small uh, caliber chest tubes. Um, and really those, uh, those shunts, um, they're basically temp they're vascular or they're plastic tubes that can be placed into the injured vessel proximally. Uh, and then controlled either with a, a ligature around the vessel to lock that shunt in place um, or a, a, a rubber vessel loop. And then that shunt is, uh, you want to make sure that you have uh, blown out any clot uh, that was a thrombus that was, was there and let, let some couple of heartbeats blow uh, uh, red blood through the shunt and then, and then occlude it with a clamp um, and then insert it into the, into the distal uh, to the to the vessel that's distal to the injury. Likewise, uh, trying to make sure that the thrombus has been removed. I mentioned this earlier from that distal uh, vessel, I think is very important before you place the shunt in uh, so that you try to clear as much of the thrombus as you can, proximal and distal, and then place that shunt in and secure it either with, uh, with a heavy silk tie or, or plastic vessel loops. Uh, 
Um, most of those shunts you can listen with the Doppler uh, to you'll see arterial flow in it and you can listen uh, on the surface of the plastic shunt with a little uh, either water or, or, or acoustic gel and you can hear the, uh, the arterial flow in those shunts. And so uh, just for you know our military docs out there, if they're deploying to a roll two and uh, you know their supply sergeant calls them and asks them uh, what what kind of shunts do you want us to have? What sizes and, and what types? Uh, what what recommendations would you give to make sure that you have on hand? Yeah, it's a great question for now, and it's a challenge for us in the future. I think here and now, I would uh, I would try to um, to really make sure that that roll two surgeon put his or ha her hands on um, uh, argyle shunts. So the argyle shunts come four in a in a container. There's a uh, there's a a 12 French, uh, 14 French, maybe a 10 French and an eight French, all sort of in the same container. And, and I think seeing those and making sure you have those, you know, the larger uh, of those, um, the 14 French Argyle can work in an iliac. Um, so that would be one. Um, and probably if you had to go to one and then maybe look for a, 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 a also a 14 French chest tube, you know, to say, well, these are my shunt options. I mean, I want these, uh, I need to uh, have these available. Um, the other shunts, uh, the Sund shunt, S-U-N-D-T, um, um, the uh, the Javid shunt, J-A-V-I-D, those are other ones one could uh, ask for, but then you only have one. Um, but I think uh, that's what I would, uh, those in the thrombectomy catheters, I think it's very difficult to do uh, an effective arterial repair without the ability to do the thrombectomy proximal and distal um, because you'll be repairing that segment into thrombosed vessel with with thrombosed inflow and thrombosed outflow. So uh, I think you kind of got to get that vascular repair uh, kit, if you will, uh, assembled and communicated with your scrub team um, ahead of time uh, to, to include, here's when I say heparin saline, it's it's this is the dose I want. Uh, I need uh, these are going to be the shunts I might use. Remember to have the uh, if it's the, the, the SH needle as well as some of the smaller ones. Um, um, uh, the thrombectomy catheters. Uh, I, I need these as well. Sort of that series of, uh, of tools that, that you may you may find yourself needing. Keep in mind, uh, you know, we don't use pulmonary artery catheters much anymore, but they can be used as a as a, as a thrombectomy catheter in a pinch. And then those thrombectomy catheters can be used as good proximal inflow control, um, you know, as well. You can, you can insert a, uh, a large uh, thrombectomy catheter proximal and inflate the balloon with a three-way stopcock, and that will afford you uh, uh, inflow control in a pinch as well. Say you're having a patient transferred in from the roll two to the, the higher level of care. Uh, do you recommend uh, these patients be heparinized if able uh, when they have shunts, whether arterial or venous? If, if they can be, then then yes, that's tricky, as you can imagine. Uh, and it, it's sort of similar to can one use heparin uh, for the arterial repair itself? Uh, and, and that depends upon whether or not there are other um, injuries, a head injury or torso injury, massive soft tissue bleeding or injury. And in those cases, uh, you know, I would not shunt those. But I would not put those patients on heparin uh, because you, you, you'll cause bleeding. So our experience is that uh, the temporary vascular shunts in, in the proximal vessels, which really means uh, above the knee, you know, and proximal and uh, above the elbow and proximal, those shunts will stay patent without heparin. Uh, for um, you know four to six hours because uh, they're high flow vessels and uh, uh, I was once taught that the best anticoagulant is flow and and so if you if you have high flow in those larger proximal vessels the shunts will stay patent without heparin um, the distal shunts or if they do if the shunts clot off what we have found is they they don't cause harm when they clot off you basically are just back to square one uh, with the, with the occluded vessel, and you have to do the thrombectomy and, uh, and and the assessment repair. So even if the shunts do thrombose, our experience has been at least in the short term, if the shunts or temporary shunts are in two to four or five six hours, that they do not cause harm when they thrombose. You 
just have to do the thrombectomy and assessment at that time. Great. And just to close out kind of iliac artery injuries, if you did need to uh, ligate either the common or external iliac artery due to severe injury, what, what kind of options do you have there? Well, there it really depends on the patient, uh, their, their overall condition. If, if you found yourself having to, you couldn't put a shunt in, and for some reason, uh, the scenario was that you had to ligate the external iliac, um, you know, that patient's uh, now in a, presumably they are in, you know, they're in a, a really bad situation. Um, and, you know, the options, you, you can ligate temporarily. So I think one thing to Think about well. I'm going to ligate it, and then I'm going to get some help. Uh, I'm going to, in, in, but in two or three hours, I need to, you know, I need to now go back and try to reestablish inline flow uh, with another set of hands, with more blood, with a different surgeon or different lighting or different tools. Um, because leaving it ligated, you're going to, you know, incur a tremendous amount of ischemia uh, into that extremity. I mean, there, I suppose, are the options of a cross femoral graft. Um, I don't think I've ever done that in the setting of trauma, you know, coming, bringing a PTFE graft uh, from the other, other groin, the other femoral artery over to the, uh, to the injured femoral artery. Um, that would, that would be um, extra, extraordinary or unusual. But uh, and the options are just life over limb and just say, well, I, I can't repair it. I can't, uh, the scenario, whatever the reason, uh, doesn't allow me to establish inline flow and the patient's going to get an amputation and uh, we're going to work on saving his or her life uh, and, and move on. That is uh, fantastic advice. Um, as we move our way down the leg, um, I want to stop and focus on the common femoral for a minute here and just discuss sort of the, the principles of controlling this um, options. If ligation is an option at this level for any of the branches, and then uh, is this, you know, in residency, they, we would talk about in blast injuries, accessing the common femoral to get hemorrhage control. Uh, is this a common maneuver performed in the, the trauma, uh, combat trauma? So it's, I think it's, um, the common femoral is not a whole lot. It's, it's not much less consequential than the iliac. In fact, uh, it's probably every bit as consequential as far as ligating it. So it can be ligated uh, as a damage control maneuver, but the consequences will be significant of ligating the common femoral, uh, just as significant as uh, as the iliac, uh, external iliac. So, um, um, you know, uh, you know, there, there's a couple of, as you know, there's uh, there's there's three femoral arteries. There's the common, the uh, the deep femoral, and uh, and then the superficial femoral. Um, you know, I think similar to what I mentioned before, all efforts should be maintained to, to try to maintain or establish flow through through those three, uh, if if at all possible. Uh, balancing, you know, the the, uh, the the situation at hand, which sometimes means I've got to ligate it, and uh, because uh, because of, of the flow of casualties, because of the capability I have at a given level. Uh, again, ligation, life over limb is, uh, is, is still an important damage control uh, maneuver. You just have to be ready for the consequences um, uh, of that and, and, and move on. Um, so, uh, yeah, controlling it. I mean, I think the Fogarty catheters are useful to control the deep femoral. Sometimes you can, uh, from the open common, you can, you can insert a small Fogarty down into the orifice of the deep femoral and inflate that balloon. Uh, and, and control back bleeding from the profunda. Often there's two profunda femoris arteries. So, you know, they're difficult to control. They're right adjacent to the femoral vein, um, the deep femoral vein. So um, oftentimes controlling those deep femoral vessels from the inside using the small Fogarty's and a three-way stopcock is, uh, is, is quite handy. Um, and then the same tenants apply, uh, you know, either placing a shunt, uh, trying to do a primary repair, uh, or, or some sort of interposition repair. So the popliteal artery is uh, an area that we frequently uh, see injuries and they can be quite difficult to manage. Um, can you discuss uh, just a little bit about um, how you best, uh, you know, expose, uh, set up the patient when you're trying to access the popliteal artery both above and below the knee? Yeah, I will. And I, 
skipped a question there. You asked about accessing the common for, for uh, control. I think that's uh, acceptable. I mean, it just depends on where the injury is. Um, I mean, and, and who's managing the case. I think if it's a individual who has not done, you know, uh, 15 or 20 or 30 of these sorts of cases and, and they feel comfortable about accessing the common femoral to control it, um, I don't think there's anything at all wrong with that. Um, uh, on the flip side is if it's a distal SFA, uh, superficial femoral artery injury or a popliteal artery injury, in those situations, most of the time it does not uh, require and should not require, uh, you know, just a, a virgin cut down on, on an uninjured common femoral. Um, but that just depends. Uh, it's, it's acceptable for sure. Um, the uh, the popliteal, you know, I think this is really important. Uh, uh, you know, um, you know, to, to get inflow control to the popliteal, one has to expose the above knee popliteal artery, which is really the distal segment of the superficial femoral artery as it comes through the adductor magnus or Hunter's Canal. Um, I think, uh, you know, starting with a wide incision uh, or a long incision, I guess, uh, from above the knee to the mid thigh. And, and uh, uh, in this case, it's really, I think, important to make sure that you have a small sort of bump, if you will, of rolled towels that are placed uh, underneath the calf so that you kind of prop the leg up in a frog leg position in a way and, and let gravity pull the uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the the musculature of the of the leg uh, down uh, with gravity, and then find the uh, the distal superficial femoral proximal above knee popliteal, uh, just just at or beyond Hunter's Canal, and then move the uh, move the bump above the knee uh, uh, once you've got the above knee, and, and and then make a medial incision, a separate medial incision uh, below the knee, um, again using sort of gravity in a in a way to pull the gastroc and soleus uh, down so that you can open up that pop baloney popliteal space um, and 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 uh, you know make a medial incision that uh, that allows you to take the gastroc and the soleus down uh, and, and right on the, the medial edge of the uh, or the inferior edge of the the tibia uh, and sort of uh, open up that baloney popliteal space you know, in this situation, you're going to need Wheatlander retreat, uh, retractors. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we have something uh, uh, called a popliteal retractor, which which um, has has different depths of, of blades on the uh, on the retractor. Uh, there, that's also referred to as a, a Henley popliteal retractor or a Pilling. I think Pilling must be the company that makes it, but. But those are awfully handy because uh, you need to, uh, you may need varying depths of blades deeper than the uh, than the standard Wheatlander retractor. Things to keep in mind, and then and then being able to really put a, a handheld retractor, uh, a narrow handheld retractor uh, like an appendiceal or a, a Wiley uh, renal vein retractor uh, that allows you to to really retract. If if you're above the knee, you you. In that exposure, you, you can put that narrow handheld um, uh, kind of on the inferior aspect of the wound and, and sort of toe in and, and, and really get down into the popliteal space itself. Uh, if you're below the knee, you, you put it, uh, you put that narrow handheld uh, in the proximal extent and again, toe in and you really can try to get that, uh, that uh, uh, popliteal space itself uh, exposed. If you need to, you can join the the uh, the above and below knee incisions sometimes the trauma the, the injuries they're joined anyway uh, um, but those are sort of some tenants lighting you know it can't be uh, overstated how important lighting is uh, sometimes that's a luxury I know uh, for those who are in a deployed setting but uh, um, those are sort of the the, the top line uh, uh, things I think about with uh, popliteal artery exposure. Absolutely. Uh, just from one of my own clinical experiences is I, I realized, in, especially in young patients, uh, repairing or bypassing the popliteal artery, many times these patients have a very severe vasospasm at the end of a case. And you may do a beautiful bypass and really have minimal uh, kind of Doppler signal in the foot at the conclusion of the case. Um, do, have you experienced this? And uh, do you have any uh, kind of thoughts on this? Well, I think the, um, so yeah, for sure. I mean, 
So if the, if the bypass is sort of a above knee to below knee uh, and you've excluded or ligated the, the injured, popliteal, injured popliteal artery, for example, then, um, then uh, absolutely a lot of times the, um, the, uh, the patient will be relatively cold and, and, uh, and in a vasoconstrictive sort of um, uh, condition. And so, you know, um, I think um, as long as you feel like the, there, there's flow in the, in the, in the reversed vein bypass, you, you can hear audible flow. It's not a water hammer signal, uh, meaning that there's some diastolic flow in, in, in the arterial signal. And then there's some sort of weak signal at the ankle. Um, uh, then, you know, uh, most of the time I will just uh, be done and warm the patient up and resuscitate him. Um, if any of those things are not true, uh, you, you don't have any arterial signal in the graft, or it's if you do, it's a water hammer uh, signal, um, um, or there's no no signal at all at the foot um, or beyond the graft. Um, then I think you you gotta you gotta open it up and uh, and pass thrombectomy catheters proximal and distal and get that regional heparin, the heparin I saline, and really see make sure there's not a problem. But that's really a judgment call, and it is uh, it is uh, anxiety provoking for sure. Uh, but you, you kind of have to have faith, and, and I do think that uh, that if you if you feel like you technically you saw all of your stitches, you felt like it was good, you had some good outflow uh, back bleeding before you did the distal. You pulled. You didn't forget to do the thrombectomy distal. You didn't forget to do the thrombectomy po proximal, and you've got signals even if there's spasm. Um, and it's just, you feel like it's not as good as it should be. Um, uh, in some of those cases, you warm the patient up and resuscitate them and, uh, and, and, and the signal will, will improve. You can also do an on the table arteriogram, but you know, that in an austere location is, um, that is, uh, that can be a little bit of get going down a rabbit hole because then, you know, you'll see, you'll start chasing ghosts. You'll see, then you'll see the spasm and, and one will say, well, geez, now I need to intervene on the spasm or, uh, you know, an on-table arteriogram is certainly an option, and it, it should not be discounted. Uh, but I also think that, uh, you know, I would encourage folks to, as long as those things are true, you saw your anastomosis, you, you did proximal and distal, you felt good about your inflow and your outflow, you've got an arterial signal that has got some diastolic flow in it, it's not water hammer in the graft, and you've got some signal beyond it. Um, you know, warm the patient up and, and see how they do. Great, great. Um, so as we continue down the leg, uh, we encounter our tibial vessels. How, how do you decide on uh, repairing uh, tibial vessels versus just ligating them? So there's a great uh, paper I would refer, you know, you and your listeners to um, that was probably was published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery in 2010 or 11. Um, uh, Burkhart was the, uh, I believe, the Gabriel Burkhart was the lead author, and it was uh, a review of our experience, the U.S. military's experience, uh, with the practice of selective tibial artery repair. Um, and when you think about what that means, you, selective repair means we we repair some but not all uh, tibial arteries. So how do you determine which ones to repair? That was a good review article in the Journal of Vascular Surgery that I think looked at maybe a hundred tibial artery <clears throat> injuries. And what we found from that experience was that uh, the principles of selective repair uh, led us to, to fix those patients in which there was all three tibial arteries were injured, meaning that uh, it wasn't just the posterior tib, but, the, but because of the injury pattern, the perineal had been severed and the anterior tibial had been severed, and there was just no, no flow in the foot. So in those situations, uh, we so we did repair them with a re reverse saphenous vein graft. That's that's the exception. The majority of times, as you're alluding to, uh, and in that case series, we we did not repair them because, and we could ligate the uh, the single tibial artery injury because the others there's redundant flow, uh, redundant arterial flow to the foot, um, and uh, and so you can. Um, you can you can ligate it, listen on the table, and if, if the other tibial vessel or two uh, 
uh, is patent, then it can remain ligated and should remain ligated because you don't need to tibial artery repairs are even more technically challenging and time consuming. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, so I think we're going to shift our focus as we uh, begin to conclude the episode here and, and cover venous injuries. What are your thoughts? We've been talking a lot about the possibilities of ligating arterial injuries. Uh, how do you approach venous injuries and ligation? So I think this is also would fall under the, I, I would use the descriptor, I guess, selective repair, which means you repair some, but not all. Um, and, and I think the, um, without going into too much detail, it, it, uh, it depends. Um, so in the extremity, uh, if, uh, I would say almost all of the upper extremity veins can and just should be ligated. There's not enough uh, muscle mass and flow in, in, the, in the upper extremity veins to bother with repair. Uh, the exceptions might be a proximal axillary vein, a subclavian vein, uh, but by and large, certainly the, the, the distal axillary and, and the brachial or basilic veins, uh, cephalic, can be ligated. Uh, in the lower extremity, um, similarly, the small veins in the, in the tibial veins can be and should be ligated. There should be no attempt to repair those. Um, coming proximally in the lower extremity, I guess distal to proximal, the popliteal vein uh, and then the femoral vein, you know, I think that... Um, it, if the patient um, is uh, physiologically stable uh, uh, and, and, and performing a repair is possible or placing a venous shunt, we've had good luck with uh, venous shunts staying patent, then we have deferred to fixing the veins in those cases, uh, popliteal and femoral veins. Um, not all of them, but, but most of them, if the patient is, uh, you know, not in sh profound shock and the, if the expertise is there and present to do it and there's operating time and, and such, um, then I think uh, there is benefit to fixing those veins. Uh, at least, uh, and there's, there's been studies that, that confirm that that approach uh, probably um, uh, affords better arterial flow. Uh, in the arterial repair, because the venous outflow is not impeded. It does not lead to, even if those veins thrombose over time, uh, they do it slowly and do not lead to pulmonary emboli. Uh, that's, you know, our experience anyway. And so when we can, uh, we will fix those uh, veins in the popliteal and femoral segments. Conversely, if the patient, if the capability doesn't exist, the surgeon's not used to that, uh, the patient is uh, not doing well physiologically, or there's the need for the operating table and you just got to, you got to ligate it. Uh, those patients, uh, then I think ligating uh, those veins in the, in the popliteal or femoral segment are also acceptable as a damage control maneuver. Great. And we couldn't finish a uh, peripheral vascular trauma talk without discussing uh, fasciotomies. Uh, what are your advice, uh, your advice for the listeners uh, regarding yeah. fasciotomies? Great, great point. Um, um, and I think we, we are, uh, you know, I think in the military setting, we've been liberal about uh, the performance of uh, two incision, four compartment, lower extremity fasciotomies. Uh, so think about that two incisions, we have pretty long incisions, uh, four compartment fasciotomies. And I think they should be done um, um, more liberally in our setting in the military uh, because, uh, and so I, you know, we advocate for them um, and have shown that they can be done without substantial additional morbidity or mortality. In fact, waiting to do a fasciotomy or missing a fasciotomy has been shown to be associated with mortality uh, early uh, data early from the wars. Um, so, Part of that is, is in our system, we often are going to lose track of these patients. We will see them at a roll two. And then we'd like to think, well, they don't need the fasciotomy at the roll two because they'll do it at the roll three, or uh, we're not going to do it at the roll three because they can do it in, in at the roll four. But uh, again, we, we're going to be evacuating these patients at altitude and, uh, and they're going to go out of our care. So I think uh, I err on the side of, of prophylactic uh, uh, two incision, four compartment 
fasciotomies in the setting of lower extremity vascular injury, certainly wartime vascular injuries. For your time today, and we are excited uh, to continue this vascular trauma series with you. I really appreciate uh, the conversation and congratulate you um, and your team on, on, on such great work. It's a great project. Thank you for listening to Audible Bleeding. And we have four more episodes with Dr. Todd Rasmussen coming out over the next couple of months. So make sure you look out for those both on Behind the Knife and on Audible Bleeding. Thanks for listening.